All right, I'm gonna start with some emails that came from the last couple of weeks. And also, I just wanna make a little announcement. Um, when you guys are sending me email questions for the Q&A, please keep it to one to two paragraphs max. And I don't mean like a really long paragraph. I mean like, you know, short little paragraphs because I'm just not going to have time to read really long messages like that with a lot of background. Um, so let me start with this one. Um, this guy says, I am married to a narc wife. I have, oops. I have a 10 year old daughter and want to escape the marriage of 11 years now. I am sucked dry of all that is within me, even to try to stay married. I want to know if you have any advice for a father of a 10 year old in the mix. So, you know, the first thing is I would recommend getting real about like, why are you staying? Why are you still staying? And, you know, are you making a plan to leave? Are you considering leaving? What is it that's keeping you there? And, if you find that your answer is your daughter, I would encourage you to reevaluate because so many experts agree. Um, you know, John Bradshaw, for example, he's an author, the author of Homecoming, um, and then like The Shame That Binds You. He talks a lot about the inner child work. And so many other people say it is so much better to get divorced so that both parents can try to be happy and can try to teach their children that versus if you get into a situation in life and you're unhappy, you just stick it out and you just keep sticking it out and you just keep sacrificing your happiness because essentially that's the message that you're sending to the kids. Not that, um, you know, so many people are afraid that when they get divorced that they're sending this horrible message to the kids. And surely it's traumatic for the kids when the divorce happens. But so many times I talk to adults who say, man, I wish my parents would just have gotten divorced or I wish they would have gotten divorced like years before. And, you know, it was just, it was so miserable for us too to stick it out. And we also got to understand is that kids are internalizing everything. Like, you know, you might think that you're keeping the tension of your marriage under wraps and your kid is clueless about it, but that's probably not the case at all. Your kid is probably totally tapping into that and acting that out or acting that in in some way. You know, she's either acting out in school and with her friends in some sort of emotional way because she can't process her feelings about what's going on at home. And maybe it's like, kind of kept quiet and so like she has this like cognitive dissonance of like what she feels is happening and, and what she's tapping into and then what mommy and daddy are actually saying you know or she might be acting it in she might be getting sick a lot she might be taking it out on herself in some way you know um and so you know if you're noticing those effects in your daughter that's probably a wake-up call you know to recognize that sticking it out just for the kids is usually not a great idea you know, it's usually better to plan, you know, to separate as amicably as possible, you know, which is very complicated when you're dealing with a very manipulative and even abusive person. Um, and then harder even still when they're the parent of your kids, harder even still when you're the man and the whole system is set up against you, you know, the family court system, the custody, all of that it's significantly more complicated indeed, but it's not impossible and people do it all the time. And so I would really encourage you, you know, to, to consider why you're still there. And, you know, if, if you feel like you're ready to take that step to get out of there, what kind of life do you want to build? What kind of role model do you want to be for your daughter? You know, like, cause right now you're teaching your daughter the blueprint, the template, for how she's going to perceive love and relationships for the rest of her life, you know, until she does a lot of deep inner work as an adult, like we're all doing right now. Right. And, you know, what do you want to provide for her? You know, what kind of example do you want to provide for her? Because one thing is, is telling kids things and the whole other thing is like living the example. Cause that's what kids actually internalize. That's what they actually perceive is like the living example of you as dad. You know, so I would really encourage you to reconsider, you know, why you're still there and are you ready to leave and what kind of life, you know, start 
dreaming up like what kind of life do you want to have how do you envision it do you envision having your daughter on the weekends do you envision her having her half the time two weeks with you two weeks with her mom like how is that going to work you know and really start thinking about that and also checking in with how you feel you know because one thing is to get lost in the mind and get into all this analysis and rational stuff and thinking and planning and fears and doubts and all of this and a whole other thing is to like settle down inside yourself and really ask yourself, how do you feel? How do you want to feel? What's the life that you want to create that feels good to you? Because it has to feel good. If it doesn't feel good, it's not the right path. You know, you're not going to really feel like you're thriving in life unless you can feel good. So that's what I would encourage you to do is to find that feel good. Like, where does it feel good? How does it feel good? What kind of life do you envision having? What kind of relationship do you envision having with, having with your daughter? How do you envision making the best of it, you know, with her mother through the separation and then even through like sharing the custody, you know, and so your daughter becomes an adult and really find that spot, find, you know, that dream that feels good to you. And that's the direction you want to start moving in. And it's so much easier when you love it. Like when you, when it feels good and you love it, it's so much easier to manifest things. It's so much easier to take action. It's so much easier for the universe to help you. If the, all you're getting is like obstacles, obstacles, obstacles from the universe, it's not the path. You're not you're not quite in there yet, probably because you got to tap into what feels good and you're still in some place that doesn't feel good. You're still accepting something, settling for something that doesn't feel good. So you want to upgrade that. You want to put yourself into the situations, into the state, into the feeling that feels good and create your life around that feeling. All right. I'm going to answer another question from email here too. Someone asked, do you think certain cultures are more likely to produce narcissists compared to others? I ask this because the last few British men I have met have been some of the absolute worst covert narcissists I've ever seen. One of them is an immigrant to the US, but the others are still living in the UK. That's funny um, because I've met four, five, or six really malignant ones from the UK as well. In fact, I even find that accent almost triggering sometimes. Um, depends where too, because they, they all had specific accents. And uh, Dr. or not Dr. Um, Richard Grannon, you know, the, uh, the Spartan life coach, he's from England and he talked about this in one of his videos. I don't remember which video it was, um, but he talked about how like there's like an extremely high percentage of narcissists, psychopaths, sociopaths on that island for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, it's interesting to look at, you know, the history, you know, Britain was always conquering around the world. It's a very narcissistic thing, right? Look at the USA though. I mean, right now the USA is one of the biggest like international offenders, you know, as malignant narcissists in the global arena, you know, and how the USA gets into places and dominates and imposes, you know, their way and our way is the best way in America, you know? And so like that culture is very alive here too, you know, and, and it seems like wherever that culture was exported, you know, Britain exported their culture around the world, USA exports their culture around the world. It's just everywhere. And, you know, it, it, what I've discovered is that when you, when you travel deep enough into the third world, that it's like barely been touched by like the materialistic culture and whatnot, you find this kind of purity of heart. And even when you don't understand and speak the language of the natives, like Quechua in the Andes Mountains, for example, if you go really high up into the Andes, you know, they don't speak Spanish, maybe you don't speak Quechua but there is, you can feel this palpable heart connection with the people. And, and they live a very different lifestyle. They haven't really been contaminated with that virus. And it really seems to be in the first world, you know, wherever this like, it's like, it's, it's not capitalism per se, but it's like the pursuit of greed and the pursuit of more and not caring about the other and, you know, just seeking this goal and it doesn't matter what you have to do and who you heard along the way, that's like very much the culture of like a lot of corporations and, you know, areas in society. And it's even celebrated. 
you know, so it really does seem to be a first world disease, a virus of the mind of the first world. You know, it really doesn't seem to have touched those places where they haven't had contact with this, these forms of culture. And, and it's almost like it travels through the culture in that way. Um, but I would look for, or um, Dr. Why do I keep saying that? I keep associating him with uh, Dr. Vaknin. With Richard Grannon, the Spartan life coach, um, he did do a video on that. And I think he, you know, specifically talking about the UK, since that's what you're asking about, he specifically talked about that. I believe he mentioned more about the history of that, if you are interested. Um, he definitely has some information on that. And to also, I've heard from a lot of people, you know, I typically hear from people who got involved with narcissists in USA, England, or the UK in general, but usually England, predominantly England, actually, um, and then various other countries. But it seems to be that, you know, it's where, where the, these cultures have really centered that you find this, this illness. Someone writes in here, too. Um, Yes, about the English. I've yet to meet one that I can warn to. I thought it was me because in my country, we do not like them. Also, the narc's father is dating a woman from the UK. They are all well-met birds of the feather in Canadians. Yeah, it's not that everyone from the UK, right? But it seems to be a high percentage density in the population there for whatever reason. You know, I think it's pretty high in USA, too. I think it's probably pretty high in South Africa, too, from what I'm gathering. I mean, but again, it's, it's still all around the world. It just seems to be really centered in these areas for some reason. Also, I just realized I just included Ireland. I'm sorry, in the UK. Ireland is not part of the UK. I will admit, I only just learned that this year. That's embarrassing. Um, okay, let me check out another email here. No, it's not. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know until I met you, actually. And then I, you mentioned something, and I looked it up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. This guy asks, "Do all narcs go nuts when you let them know you are not in love with them any longer? If so, what do you suggest when, at this moment, I'm still married to her?" Wow, Venus is snoring. Sorry about that. Um, at this moment, I'm still married to her, and I am not in love, and I am devising an escape plan. She always tries to say to me most days, I love you, and I just can't find it in me to respond back with an I love you too. I'm not good at hiding my real feelings. I have tried in the past to sit down with her and have a peaceful conversation and say, you know, this just isn't working. We need to go our separate ways. Hope we can do it peacefully with the kids being number one. She would ask, do you not love me? I would say, well, I love you as my daughter's mom and always will. And she would go nuts on me in that moment. Any suggestions? So most likely that sounds like the borderline personality disorder. Um, I don't know if you've done any research on that. Um, it's similar to narcissistic personality disorder, a little bit different. As parents and as partners, they tend to be very demanding of love, like worship me, show me love. And it's like in a different way than, than the narcissist typically goes about it. Um, the way that the borderline does. And the borderline will use all forms of manipulate, like guilt tripping is their favorite form of manipulation to get you to love them, to show them your love. And you know, it's very confusing because they make themselves look like victims. So that's possibly what you're dealing with here. Um, and that's probably why she has such a hard time when you don't say that because she like she's dying to hear those words and i struggled with this with my mom a lot too um she would have this pattern where at the end of a phone call it would be a ritual it would be like i love you and then she would wait and then i would you know she'd wait for me to say it and then when i said i loved you she'd go thank you you know and then let me off the phone and it was always like and it started to feel like grosser and grosser because it was like this expectation like it wasn't even like authentic it wasn't like you know, when you tell somebody that you love them, it should be like an authentic expression, like just in the moment, it's spontaneous. It just comes out because you're so feeling that in the moment, not like at the end of every conversation, we tell each other we love each other, you know, that's, that's a bunch of horse shit. And it just, it bothered me because it was so inauthentic and I just stopped doing it. I just stopped doing it. And at first she was upset, you know, just like your person was upset when you didn't say it. And, you know, that's what happens is like when you set a boundary, 
or you don't give, you know, a boundary could simply be you're not giving a person something that they want because it doesn't work for you. Like it's not authentic for you. Like you said, you have a hard time, like not acting on your real feelings. And that's, that's great. That's awesome because you're not sacrificing your authenticity and sure it's creating tension in this relationship, but that's because this person is asking something of you that you can't give them that you don't want to give them because it's not authentic for you. So you're going to have to, you know, start setting that boundary and just don't say it back. You know, maybe you don't even need to say something like, you know, I always love you like the mother of my daughter. You already made that clear. Um, I would just not say it. Just not say it. Not defend yourself or make an excuse or anything like that. Or, you know, give in to like the guilt tripping kinds of stuff because that's probably what's going to happen if you don't say it back. But you got to be authentic with you. You know, you can't sacrifice your authenticity to make peace because you're not taking care of yourself. You're not loving yourself. You know, self-love, you know, the foundation of self-love is self-honesty. Like that's where it totally starts. If you can't be honest with yourself, you can't love yourself. The next step is you start taking care of yourself, right? And taking care of yourself partly is about your boundaries because in the boundaries that you set, you're taking care of what works for you and what doesn't work for you, what you tolerate and what you don't tolerate, what's okay for you, what's not okay for you, what's healthy for your growth and what's not, what's good for your health and your sanity and your well being and what's not, right? And you have the right to set those boundaries. And it's a big part of your self care. It's like the first part of self care is setting those boundaries, you know, because until you get the wrong people out of your life or the wrong habits out of your life, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be healthy. You're not going to have clarity of mind. You're not going to have energy. You know, you're not going to be, it's just everything. It's not going to work unless you start with those boundaries in the self-care arena. So you want to set the boundaries, you know, and getting more and more real with yourself about what you need. And maybe you're really detached from that. Maybe you don't know a lot. Like you have this feeling like you, you can't say that because it just doesn't feel good to you. Okay, that's good. What else? You know, like what else do you need to do for yourself to take care of yourself? What other new boundaries do you need to set? Yeah, things are going to get a little bit uncomfortable and tense in the short term, but it's a necessary step to take care of yourself. And what else do you need to do to take care of yourself? Where do you need to say no? You know, like what's, what's at least one place in your life right now, everyone listening to this, what is one place in your life right now where you need to start saying no more? One area of your life, is it like a person, a relationship, um, a certain habit or thing that you do, something happening at work, something happening at home, where in your life is there like a no that's like, you really need to say that no. Like, you know, it's not good on your health. You know, it's draining your energy. And it's really important to do that, you know, because when you're coming from the old codependency patterns where you tend to people please and put someone else's needs and wants before yours, you're sacrificing yourself and you're not saying no somewhere, you know, and then later on, you'll regret it, you know, because you'll feel like crap maybe you start to get sick or maybe you just feel exhausted or maybe you just start to become resentful because you've given up all this time and energy to some person, you know, really you wanted to spend it on taking care of you or spending it with your family or your loved ones or creating your work or whatever it is that you want to do in your life. Where in your life do you need to start saying no more often? Part of your self-care you know, and then where in your, your life do you need to start saying yes more often? Like for me, it was all about getting in touch with the inner child and playing, like saying yes to play because I tend to like absorb myself in my work and just like fully dedicate so much time and energy and work. And really this month, you know, it's like this month of September, huge month of focusing on self-care. There's all kinds of changes that are happening, lots of stuff happening, big month to start making new steps in self-care. And if you're not doing it, you're probably starting to feel really uncomfortable. Like maybe lots of irrational fears are coming up or just like a lot of discomfort it means there's, there's a boundary that's not okay in your life. Somewhere you probably need to start saying no more often to protect something, to take care of yourself, you know? And then what do you need to say yes to? Because there's probably some area in your life that you're blocking because you're investing all your energy in something where you need to put an, another no 
where you also want to be spending some energy somewhere else, like playing, you know, like if you're the kind that just like pours yourself into work and works and works and works and doesn't take time out for yourself and to play because, you know, of all this other stuff that you could be doing, you know, investing your time and energy there, take some time for yourself. Step away from that a little bit. Like the world is not going to end if you walk away from that, you know, and spend some time on yourself and don't feel guilty about that. You know, us recovering codependence, sometimes we feel guilty about taking care of ourselves and spending time on ourselves and saying no to other people, you know, like saying no to someone because you just want to spend the day to yourself and just, you know, in your own inner child and playing and doing what makes you happy versus going and, and taking care of something for someone else or however it is. So where in your life can you also start saying yes more often to celebrate you and your authenticity and your self-care? Because the more you take care of yourself, the more you start to believe that you love yourself. You know, I learning to love yourself, like remember that, um, Saturday Night Live skit, I think it was like in the 80s, maybe early 90s, Stuart Smiley might have been the name, and he was like, like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me, and it was like all this like trying to like love himself in the mirror, and like, it's just, it's not really going to work that way unless you're taking steps and actions to show yourself that you are taking care of yourself, because by taking care of yourself, you're loving yourself. You know, that's how you show your care to other people when you take care of them. And if you come from that caretaker role of codependency and you want to start to break that pattern a bit more, you know, where like you start to take care of yourself more instead of always taking care of someone else first, that's when you want to start saying no to something in your life and then start saying yes to something else to build your self-love. So that's what I would focus on, you know, in this situation, instead of worrying about telling her the words that she needs to hear and all of this, she gets mad. Oh, well, that's her. That's, that's her thing. That's not about you. You need to be authentic. You need to be authentic with yourself. You need to role model that for your daughter. And it's really good that you're devising an escape plan. That's really great. I'm glad to hear that, you know, because it's, it's not working. It's, it's sounding like it's just not working at all, you know? And in fact, that's even the words you said, it's just not working. So, you know, I would, I would take these little steps day by day by day as you're making these plans and as you're moving toward your escape, you know, and gradually building more and more your self-care, your self-love, because the more you love yourself, the more self-esteem you're going to have, the more energy you're going to have, the better you're going to feel, the easier it's going to be to get out of there. The whole reason it's so hard to get out of there is because your self-worth is plummeted, your self-love is plummeted, you know, and that's what you want to rebuild so that you have that confidence and that drive and that just that knowing that everything's going to be okay. Because when you're leaping out of those relationships, it's like sometimes you're leaping where there's no net. You know, and you're just, you're hoping that the net is going to appear or you're hoping that you're going to learn how to fly, you know, one or the other, because that's like often that point where we get out of these relationships, you know, and it's why it's so, so hard to leave. So it's great that you're in touch with your authenticity. Keep focusing in that direction. Keep working on the self-love and keep practicing letting go of your reaction, your emotional reaction when she's not happy with your boundaries. You're just going to have to get used to that discomfort in the moment to invest in your long-term peace of mind. Um, someone writes here, you talked about feeling the fear and needing to get away. I had felt the fear. I wasn't even looking at him, but I feel fear. And when I looked at him, he was staring at me with a scary smile on his face. It seemed so unreal. It sounds like you're talking about like that psychopathic stare, you know, that is so, so, so creepy. I know exactly what you mean. And when you see, that's like the mask is down and you catch them in that moment and maybe like they didn't realize you were looking at them or maybe they did it purposely to intimidate you. Either way, you saw the real face, you know, and yeah, it, it's terrifying to see that face, like absolutely terrifying, especially because of like, they're smiling behind all of that. Yeah, you know, that's, that's how they manipulate you too, is that fear. And it's, it's so hard to not give in to that fear, you know, and to hold yourself strong and to make a plan to get out of there, to get away from that, you know, because they win when you give in to the fear, when you let them terrorize you like that, that's how they like start to suck 
your energy out of there. I just noticed a name pop up in here of someone that I believe I sent an email to that said to cease and desist all contact. I specifically said to not come to the Q&A sessions as well. I made the boundary very clear. I'm not sure why you're here right now. I know you received that email. I'm taking a screenshot. And I'm kicking it out. See ya. Sorry about that, guys. Had a bit of a stalker situation lately. Alrighty, just calm down the anxiety of it. I'm just gonna take a few breaths right now. Awesome. Okay. Someone says, I just wanted to share that I have a narcissistic parent. I was diagnosed with PTSD and I'm worried because I'm in college and it's hard to focus on studying with PTSD. Plus, I hate that I even feel judged by my narc parent because I'm not being a golden child anymore. The perfect son, successful and aware of the ongoing abuse, golden child and punching bag at the same time. A therapist once told me I was not studying enough as a protest against my narc parent. I think maybe it's true because I hate to be their narc supply, but I also want to break free from them. So I must study. My personal life is a war against my narc caretakers, and this prevents me from being successful. I struggle with taking responsibility for my life because I am too busy protesting maybe. Also, I can't, excuse me one second. I just noticed this name pop up again. If you are someone other than the person that I think you are with the same name, which I doubt because no one else on my entire list has that name, then please send me an email and I will apologize to you. But if you are that person that I sent that email of cease and desist to, and I specifically told you to stay away from here, and you came back, I'm removing you again. Do not enter this forum. Do not contact me again do not contact anyone else in my audience again and stay away i have made this explicitly clear i'm so sorry for that okay so to this person who was asking this question before we were interrupted again and again Okay, so this person saying, can't really focus because of PTSD. Any suggestions how to break free from this mess? So, okay, I don't know how old you are to this person. I don't, are you, if you would like to let me know, um, I'm just curious how old you are. Maybe if you're really young, I might have a little bit different advice for you. Um, and it, God, it is really, really hard to grow up with a narcissistic parent. Um, that's amazing that you were able to get diagnosed with PTSD, that somehow you were able to get help and figure out what was going on. That's wonderful that you were able to identify it. Most people spend a long time unable to identify the PTSD because of the abusive relationship, because we don't even realize often, I didn't even realize, you know, that an abusive relationship can cause PTSD. So, you know, PTSD, as you probably know, if it goes untreated for a long period of time, it's when it gets worse and, you know, it becomes the C PTSD or complex post-traumatic stress. That's when it gets really bad. It just compounds over time. So it's great that you found out and that you're working on that. Um, and it says, did you talk about a therapist in here? Um, okay, so I'm sorry, I just had to boot that person again. This, this just might go on for a little while, um, but the next step is now I need to go file a stalker protection order because it's just out of hand. So, um, okay, do you have a therapist 
you got diagnosed with PTSD. Are you still seeing someone? Are you able to see a therapist? Um, yes. Okay. That's awesome. Because that is really, really important um, to deal with the PTSD. Um, okay. You said, I hate that I even feel judged by my narc parent because I'm not being a golden child anymore, the perfect son. So that's awesome. What that means is that you're setting new boundaries. Somehow, I don't know if you're learning that from your therapist or how you're learning that. You're not playing that role anymore. You're not giving into that anymore, which is awesome. Okay, so it definitely gets more uncomfortable in the short term. And it's totally worth it, you know. And I, so are you still living at home? Okay, you're 22. Um, you know, so that's awesome. You're over 18. Um, I don't, I don't know if you're still living there. I'm sorry. I'm slightly distracted. I'm having a little bit of a hard time focusing because my anxiety was really triggered by that situation. Um, so, okay. Your therapist told you that you're not studying enough as a protest against your narc parent. That will often happen and also because it's so hard to focus when your anxiety is triggered. How perfectly synchronistic. When your anxiety gets triggered, the amygdala right now in my brain is firing a lot of anxiety signals. And so it's triggering the, the, the primitive part of my brain, which is making it harder to think and send energy to the frontal lobe, the neocortex. And so you'll probably notice that in school, that when you start to think about your narc parent, you get triggered or you get a text message or a phone call or you have, you know, some kind of contact with the narc parent. And there's like a period of time afterward where, you know, right now, like the adrenaline, the cortisol is coursing through my blood. And it's just, it's really hard to keep yourself focused. And so it takes practice. Like you're, you might even be shaking, you know, it's just, it's the body's reaction to these chemicals and it takes practice. And what I do is I breathe. You know, as soon as I get into that overwhelm, I know when that overwhelm is triggered, my inner child is triggered. My frightened inner child is triggered. It's triggering all these memories of the things. And that's probably, you know, what's happening. You'll have an inter interaction with your parent and it'll trigger all this stuff. Your body will start to react like that. So start breathing and just take some deep breaths and just focus your energy inside your body on your breath and just feel the breath coming in and out. And every time you wanna to go to the anxiety, just come back to the breath and just keep focusing on that breath because that breath keeps you in the here and now. The PTSD is when you're in the past. The PTSD is when something is triggered in your whole physiological process, your nervous system, your endocrine system, your muscles, the whole process of your body is is activated as if you were reliving the past. Like that's what flashbacks are. It's not just a memory, it's a whole physiological response to the past trauma. So when that happens, the most important thing to do is to bring yourself into the here and now. And something else I like to do, and I learned this from Carlos Castaneda, not about PTSD, he was talking about lucid dreaming. But the deal is when your brain gets hijacked by the amygdala like that, you can't, it's like, you don't, you're not lucid, right? It's like, it's like you're in a dream and you're out of control of it. The past is just, it's taking over and it's like, oh God, oh God, oh God, right? So how do you help yourself become more lucid in a dream? How do you help yourself become more lucid during that is find something to focus on. And so you want that to be a constant. Um, so it's probably not a good thing if it's like a thing in your home, because this could happen to you when you're out and about or traveling or something else. For me, I use my hands because that's what Carlos Castaneda's teacher taught him. Look at your hands because even in your dream, you can look at your hands and that will remind you that you're dreaming and that will be your cue to wake up, to become lucid. So when you start to panic and you need to breathe and breathe and breathe, just stare at your hands. You know, maybe you're looking at like a particular line in the palm of your hand and that's not going to go away. That's your hand, you know? And so just like stare at that and breathe and just focus and focus and focus. And like what you'll find is what I find when I, my primary fight, flight, freeze or fawn thing is to freeze the dissociation. So when I notice myself, I'll feel it in here. It's like this pool of energy. And then it becomes really hard. I can feel my eyes face out and it becomes really hard to focus. And so you need to breathe, breathe, breathe and focus on something and it brings all this energy back. 
and just keep breathing and keep focusing. And it's like, that's the coping mechanism to push through that. And you also want to allow yourself the time to really feel what you feel. Now, this advice I just gave you is great for when you're in total overwhelm and you just need to tone it down so you can calm down, you know, whether you're at home or out and about or whatever. Now, anytime you're out and about, it's not really going to be a safe and conducive place to process the emotional stuff. That's what you want to do when you get home. That's what you want to do when you get home. Sorry about that, guys. I'm just going to have to stop and keep kicking that person out. I really hope that's not anybody else, but I highly doubt that. It's, I have only one person by that name. When you're at home, and you're in a safe place, and after you've calmed down from that overwhelm, that's when you can start to allow yourself to feel the feelings, to process those feelings, because the PTSD is living in the past. It is all of the feelings from the past that have been unprocessed. So you wanna be able to process the feelings, and in order to do that, you have to truly feel them. You have to move through them to get beyond them. So you really need to feel the feelings. So, you know, allow yourself to like, is it, what is it? Is it anger? You know, who are you angry at? What does it feel like in your body? Like start asking yourself questions, like start, you know, unwinding things with questions. And so that's where you want to be that lucid state, right? And so that's where I, you want to set up some kind of thing. Like for me, it's staring at my hands to remind myself to become lucid, to pay attention in the moment you know, to pay attention, to bring myself back in the here and now. I'm so sorry. That is just so incredibly distracting. And it's just so unbelievable that this is the question that you're asking because that's exactly what you're going through. Yes, it's really hard to focus on school. You know, it's not like you're intentionally acting out, but it's probably like this physiological thing that's making it very hard for you to do that. You know, um, so it's a, you said here, you don't live at home, but in the summer you're at home. So those are going to be the hardest times for you when you are there. And if it's at all possible, you know, try to create a situation so that like by next summer, you have some other life somewhere else that you don't have to go back there anymore because it's manageable in the short term, but it's only manageable in the short term. It's not a long-term solution because you will compromise your health, your sanity, and your well-being. You know, it's, it's only a learning experience to a certain point and then it just becomes detrimental, you know? So if you can make a plan in your life so that you can just leave that behind as much as possible and have much less contact with that person and certainly not like being in the home there because that's like your parents' domain, like that's their home turf and that's where things are going to be a lot worse, even for you because like subconsciously you'll just be triggered being in that space because it's where it all happened, you know, and with the people. So, um, oh, this person also said, absolutely. So it's a paradox because it's like, I can't focus because of you. They basically pre prevent me from focusing and then blame me for not being a golden child, the narc supply. Yeah. Yeah. They, they may not even realize they're having this effect on you. The, they just, they don't, probably don't care, you know, all their, their adult children, or it, it's an adult child, if it's just one of your parents, right? And so essentially your parent being the adult child is like treating you as they're, they're their inner child acting out and they're acting out the things that they never resolved from their childhood. And they're taking those out on you. And like, they're demanding the narcissistic supply in this case, you know, you being like, the straight A student, the golden child, you know, all of that. And yeah, it's going to be really hard to focus. And yeah, you don't need to keep fulfilling that role anymore. And so now that you're breaking away from that family system, you really want to start focusing on who are you? You know, who are you really? And if you are not that role, like what was that role? Like it was, there might've been more than one. Like one of the roles might've been this golden child, straight A student, overachiever sort of energy. Maybe there was something else too. Maybe is there a caretaker role as well? Is there like a healer role? Is there like a rescuer role? You know, like mom's best friend role or dad's enabler kind of role. Is there something like that going on? So. I recommend checking out like what other roles you might have been playing in that family system and then write down like three ways that you can 
play that role less in your life. You know, like say you find yourself being a caretaker because you caretake your narcissistic parent and you took care of their emotional needs or whatever, you know, narcissistic supply they were demanding. So now you find the habit of like just wanting to caretake people. And so you attract people into your life who are very needy you know, and like need you to take care of them kind of thing. The narcissist who's like more of the victim type usually. Um, so, you know, how, how can you change the caretaker thing? So maybe you set some new boundaries with yourself. Like, you know, I, I am no longer going to, um, you know, talk to this friend when this friend calls me and wants to complain about this and that and the other in his or her life and just always wants to call and talk about this. And I spend an hour, several days a week, you know, I'm, I'm no longer going to have these phone call conversations because they're just draining me, you know, and make three, three things on this list, you know, three specific behaviors that you're going to change. And so maybe some of them are like with mom, like I'm not going to answer every phone call that mom sends me. I'm not going to answer every text message immediately that mom tries to contact me, you know? And so like you set these new boundaries with yourself to change those old roles that you were taught you had to fulfill in order to matter in your tribe, in your family system, in your community. And so you want to eradicate that role. That way you stop perpetuating that role in your life. That's how you break the codependency cycle. Um, person says here, I feel like if I become a lawyer, the narc will say, see, I shaped you. Now you are what I want you to be. So I don't want to be that. But then I want to be a lawyer for myself. This is the conflict. Yes, I had multiple roles, narc supply, listener, punching bag, scapegoat. Okay, so it really went back and forth. And were you an only child with like the golden child scapegoat uh, dynamic? Um, so I would recommend for every one of those roles that you found yourself in, I would write down each of those roles. You might find that there are certain, oh, you have a sister. Okay. Sometimes the scapegoat, I was just curious. Um, you might find that something and some, maybe, maybe like listener, you know, maybe there's something about listener that's really valuable for you as a life skill. You know, and so it's not like you want to totally eradicate the whole thing, but you want to put new boundaries around, okay, where do I need to start being less of a listener? You know, because like those phone calls that I'm always taking is like hours and hours and hours and I really need to study and I really need to focus on my life, but I'm just giving hours and hours and hours to this person. So I need to stop having those phone conversations and do less of that kind of listening, you know? So make these, make these lists for yourself, you know, it's like different ways that you can stop playing those roles. And then maybe you'll also find like what in those roles, what specific things in those roles do you want to carry forward with you? What, what specific things will, will be valuable in your career and in your life in general? And so this conflict that you're having between, you know, narc parent wanting wanting you to be you know lawyer i shaped you i take credit for you you are an extension of me i have engulfed you you know sort of situation and then you actually wanting to be a lawyer and it just might be that it just happened to be that your parents desire and your desire to be for you to be a lawyer is aligned but also, you know, remember that you're doing this for you. So if you want to be a lawyer, be a lawyer and be the best damn lawyer you can be and enjoy being the lawyer. Like if, it, if you love it and you feel good doing it, then you're in the right place and you're doing it for the right reasons. But if you're doing it only because you need the narc parent's approval or you feel like you need society's approval or you feel like you need that status in order to be accepted or something like that, those would not be the right reasons or the motivation, right? And so you always want to listen to that inner feeling like, does it feel right? Is this really what I feel? Is this really what I want to do? If this is all for me because I love it and it feels good, then yes, that's your path. It doesn't matter if your narc parent wants to try to take, you know, credit for it and see I raised my kid right and see my kid, whatever. It doesn't matter because you know, you know the truth. Like they didn't do any of that work. You did all the work. You're the one in school. You're the one studying. You're the one learning. You're the one putting in the time. You're the one putting in the energy, the investment in your career and in your future. And, and that's all you, 
and that's all your success. And, you know, even if your narc parent tries to like steal that success for you, they can't, like, they might say whatever they say and just let them say that. Don't even argue with that because you'll just waste your time and energy, you know, but know deep down inside what your motivation, what your intent is. That's the most important thing. You know, are you in it for the right reasons because you love it? then that's the thing to do. And it doesn't matter what your narc parent thinks. And that's a huge part of that, you know, that individuation, I think as Jung called it, you know, in psychology where the adult child separates from the parent in some way. And this is you now at 22. Some of us were in our thirties and forties and fifties and sixties when we make that true separation, which should have happened, you know, in childhood, but because we were raised by adult children, it didn't happen. So now as adults, we need to give ourselves that permission to go ahead and do that and to recognize that your, your approval, your validation, your success, who you are as a person has absolutely nothing to do with your parent who may or may not want to take credit for and or condemn or celebrate either way. It doesn't matter if they love it or they hate it. Just be in some place here in the middle where it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they say some horrible, awful, nasty, critical, cruel ass thing, or they're just singing your praise because either way, it doesn't matter. Don't let your approval get swung to either side. And so, you know, that's also one of the dangers of, you know, when you hear flattery from one of these manipulators, like if your parent sometimes manipulates you with flattery, be careful with that. Maintain the detachment from that flattery, don't lean into that because what they'll do is they'll suck you in on the flattery. And then as soon as you lean into that, and it's so natural to want to lean into that with the parent because the idea of parent, you know, this loving protective character is actually quite dangerous in the case of a narcissistic parent. You know, the danger is to lean into there. And as soon as you've leaned in, that's when they're going to hit you again with the next cruelty, criticism, putting you down, creating doubt and fear in your mind, you know? So, you know, really start to turn that sense of approval inward. Give yourself the approval, give yourself the permission to be the lawyer or whoever, whatever you want to be in your life, you know, not because mom or dad said, not because someone else wants that from you or someone else might get narcissistic supply because they get to talk about how their son, you know, is, is a powerful lawyer, whatever. Let them go do that, you know, the gossip circle jerks, you know, that narcissists will do, whatever. It doesn't matter. None of that defines you. None of that affects you unless you let it, right? So the most important thing is to live your life, to be happy doing what it is that you love for the reason that you love it, that you just feel so alive doing that, not for any kind of exterior approval, but because you give yourself approval to do it. You give yourself the validation and the permission to do it. Um, and I know, I'm sorry, I know it's really, really hard trying to escape these family dynamics, you know, um, just incredibly hard. So it's awesome that you're doing the work, um, you know, and, and you're helping yourself and you're growing out of this because that's really what we all, you know, those of us who are raised in these families with an adult, you know, an adult child parent, whether they were a narcissist or an alcoholic or an addict or something out, you know, some other way they were, they had not grown up themselves, you know, and then they came to parenting from this very immature emotional stance. And we didn't learn these very important things growing up. We also didn't receive oftentimes our developmental needs at specific key phases in our life. And, you know, one level we could sit and blame the parent, right? it was their responsibility. It was not your responsibility as a little child. You were a little child. You were an innocent child. You were completely dependent on the caretaking of your parents. So, um, you know, now as an adult, you know, you got to understand that your parents did the best they could. And it's not, it's not condoning what they did. It's not like it's okay what they did, but they did the best you know, what they were doing. And now as an adult, you got to be there and you got to reparent yourself. You got to be the inner parent and the inner child. So you got to nurture your inner child. You got to support your inner child. You got to love your inner child. And you got to move through those stages of growth that you didn't get growing up when you should have, you know, and it's okay because you can do it as an adult. And it's awesome that now as an adult, you can take 100% responsibility for your life. That's when things really start to change is when you take responsibility for yourself.
you know, and, and, and so that's awesome that you're doing this work. Um, says here, yes, I totally see your point. I'm trying to keep my distance from the flattery and also keep my boundaries. These days I only talk to the narc to say hi and bye, good job. It's hard to keep it up for a long time, but I'll soon leave the house again. I just wanted to say that I learned a lot through therapy, but my aha moment when it comes to narcissism came through your videos, so big thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really glad that they were helpful for you. And it's awesome that you're in therapy. Stick with that, you know, through this PTSD healing phase. And, you know, hopefully your therapist can help you too with this individuation process. You know, the, the reparenting of your inner child, you know, after leaving that family dynamic. Um, and you're going to be so much happier. Like doing this inner child work is just key. Like so, so key to changing things in your life because until you do the inner child work, it's like you'll get into a stressful situation again and you'll become that inner child and it'll just be automatic and you'll become overwhelmed. Like overwhelm is the immediate sign. Like as soon as you see overwhelm, you are in your inner child. And so like who knows what age you are. And it's good to ask yourself like, what age am I right now? Oh, you know, I'm that little six year old and mom said this and that. And then I felt this and that, or dad did this and that. And then I felt this and that, right? So, you know, it's good to track those things, track the feelings that you felt, track the feelings that are coming up in your present day adult relationships, because that's what's triggering the past. You know, that is essentially the treasure and gift. One of them, the main one, I think that we get from the narcissist, you know, as an adult or the psychopath or the borderline, whomever we meet is that they trigger those things. They trigger those old things that have to come up, you know, and to be purged and to be cleared, you know, and to be transmuted from childhood so that we can become the people that we're destined to become. Otherwise, we just keep repeating those same old patterns, you know, um, so true, yeah. Yeah, so good job. Good job doing the work. Really proud of you. Really glad that you figured out, you know, what was going on in that family dynamic. And you'll be changing things now, you know, because you're the one in the family who's standing up first. And it's always hardest to be the first person in the family who stands up and says, it ends with me. Because everyone will attack you because you're breaking the family dynamic. That dynamic works when you play that role or those roles, you know, that you played. And everything falls apart when you step out of that, you know, so they'll be resentful, they'll be upset, you know, they're not going to like it. And it's not safe to try to work those things out with them. Because if they're not in therapy, if they're not honestly working on themselves, if they're not willing to take 100% responsibility for their own thoughts, feelings, needs, perceptions of reality and actions, they're not safe, you know, so it's, it's awesome that you've got your therapist. Hopefully, you're also starting to find like a support group, some kind of like group of people, you know, that you can count on, um, sort of like as a new family that you're creating, you know, whether it's like new friends of kindred spirits, or maybe you find some kind of support group that feels really good and you start to create that new family support feeling, you know, that's awesome too. Sometimes it takes a little while to find that. Sometimes, you know, we, we talk a lot in these Q&As, people ask these questions, you know, support groups and, and whatnot. Yeah, so often you'll find a lot of predators in those groups, even like spiritual communities or religious institutions. And so you want to be very careful always in any group, you know, whether it's a support group or religious institution, a spiritual community, wherever you go, always you know, be aware of, of the people that are around you that are in the group. Does it feel okay? Does it feel safe? Are you able to speak your truth? Do you feel safe and supported and not judged when you speak your truth? You know, th that's really hard um, sometimes to find the exact group, you know, those group of friends or that support group that really aligns with you and resonates with you. But keep keep searching until you find it you know maybe it's like little by little over time this new family of friends just starts to create in your life and then that becomes your new family and and it's okay that they're not blood related to you they don't have to be sometimes you know especially for those of us who've grown up in those family dynamics quite often you know when it's when we're adults that we form our new family that's not blood related and it's just it is what it is and it can be awesome like it can be so awesome to spend holidays with people that like you have a similar lifestyle with maybe you eat similar foods and you just have a similar flow of things and it's not stressful you know versus like family holidays which is like a disaster usually and so much stress 
and just finding, you know, setting your boundaries with that and with the family as well. And you'll, you know, the more you work on yourself, the more you'll understand what those boundaries are for you with your family members, you know, is it possible maybe, you know, you, you still have some relationships some kind of gray rock communication with, you know, most of your family members, you know, maybe someday it gets to the point where you just decide to go no contact. That's entirely up to you and totally depends on your situation and your feeling. But I would a hundred percent listen to your intuition on that. Like if you just feel like you have to end that relationship for your well being, that's what you got to do, you know, and, and it's, it's going to be hard to overcome the guilt behind that because of the programming that we have about families and you can't abandon your parents and you always love thy mother and thy father and all that. But, you know, when you're talking about a dangerous person, those rules don't apply. And it's really hard sometimes, but keep reminding yourself, you know, of that, that the typical rules just don't apply in these situations. Are you guys doing a good job taking care of yourselves this month? I don't know. Oh yeah, you're noticing it too. Are you guys feeling, you know, the, these things coming up probably like in the last week, it's been intensifying, you know, some kind of reality check maybe that took place like a week ago or so where you got to take better care of yourself in some way, probably a direct, in direct, in direct connection to relationships, you know, the boundaries that you have in relationships with people um, and, and being able to take care of yourself first and foremost, like putting yourself first. This month is like an awesome month for us recovering codependence because this is like a lifetime lesson that we're learning. And, um, you know, hopefully you guys are taking some extra time for yourselves this month to like really take care of yourselves, you know, spend some more downtime, spend some more alone time, spend less time with the distractions, you know, like when, when you find it maybe difficult to fall asleep at night or something and, you know, you find, well, if you just put on a series, you know, eventually you'll just fall asleep watching the series and you'll zonk out. But that's kind of the cop out. I caught myself doing that. And I was like, okay, so I just put this thing on to like just wind everything down and, and, and fall asleep. And then I was like, no, that's a cop out. I'm avoiding something. So, okay, let's focus on the feelings here. What's coming up? What's uncomfortable? Why can I not sleep? Aha. Okay. And then go, you know, another typical thing would be, I would go to the indica cannabis and I would smoke indica and that would put me out, you know? And so I was like, all right. The other night I was like, let's, let's just, let's push through this. What's, what is this? What's this feeling? Okay. What are my typical coping strategies or distraction strategies or like just to override it? Sure. It's a temporary fix, but it's not a long-term solution. So let's focus on, you know, the long-term solution. So, you know, what can I do? Okay. Let's try meditation. Let's put on some binaural beats, you know, let's, uh, okay, that there's that feeling. Now, where is this feeling coming from? What I found was it was like inner child processing that was coming up, you know, like stuff from infancy that was coming up, feeling unwanted, feeling like I didn't belong. And then how that was like popping up in my, you know, waking life, my modern life. And so what you'll find is like, you know, when you, when you remove those distractions, and you totally face the feelings. That is self-care, like allowing yourself to feel what you feel instead of going to those habits or other distractions that we do to keep ourselves from not feeling because it's uncomfortable to feel that stuff. But we have to feel it to process it, to move through it, to move beyond it. So it's really important to allow yourself that experience to feel things, you know, to really feel it because it's like, it's like having that feeling is like, is like mourning what happened, you know, processing the grief, you know, the grief work is the feeling work, right? John Bradshaw says that he talks about the inner child work. The grief work is the feeling work and you have to feel it to heal it. You have to go through that grief process because the other alternative is to distract yourself and not really process it. And then that PTSD just festers and festers because we don't deal with it. So we got to deal with it. Someone says, I sent an email shall insert part now or next time um okay so i think i got your email it was a really long email unfortunately i can't read emails that long needs to keep it pretty short paragraph or two paragraphs pretty short so i can read them um
this is like cyberbullying or something. Isn't there a way to permanently block someone? Unfortunately, I can't block them from here, but I am going to the police now. I've already researched this and I have all the documentation. Um, yeah, it's just, I thought he would go away. I thought he would understand the boundary, but apparently not. Someone says here, been reading and highly recommend Soulmate. Master the art of aloneness and transform your life. Might need to read it twice. I haven't heard about this. That sounds great. Master the art of aloneness. I love that. That's exactly what I was just talking about, right? How like, you know, we tend to distract ourselves from the feelings. And so mastering the art of aloneness, like being willing to be alone, right? Like not distracting yourself from the feelings that you feel when you're alone, right? Because when we're hanging out with friends or other people, there's all this other stuff to focus on, right? And then when we're alone, at home, that's when we really feel things, you know, or even when we go out alone, that's when we really feel things because it's just, it's so clear, you know, there's no other distraction. There's nothing stopping you from feeling that. Um, that sounds awesome. I want to put that book on my list here. Yeah, there's some books that you got to read twice, right? Because there's just like so much in there. And like every time you read that book, you get so much more out of it. You're at like a different state in your life. You process different things, learn different things, and then you just get so much more out of it afterwards. Someone says, I'm seeing a shamanic healer next week to hopefully look into the attachment trauma more closely. That is awesome. Fantastic. Shamanism is amazing um, for healing these kinds of things, for looking at these kinds of things, like doing the tracking. They track back feelings through time, you know, could be also not just related to this life, not just related to the prenatal time when you're growing inside your mom's belly, but like also like maybe to other lifetimes and other things that could have to do with it. You know, sometimes for some of us, like those of us who are really open spiritually, you know, what we find is like that inner child wound didn't just happen in inner child. It was actually something that we took with us from a lifetime before or many lifetimes before. And it's like this pattern that now we're breaking. And it's like, as you break the pattern now, it's like you cancel that whole wave that goes, you know, to the past, to the future, to the present. It all collapses, that old pattern, and you create new patterns in your life. I decided to do it as just wanting to get to the core of things. That's fantastic. Uh, would love to hear a follow-up on that when, you're, when you finish that, how that went. Someone says, so I'm no longer on speaking terms with my sister, but now she's home from school and already when she hears me coming, I can hear her closing her door and I'm not sure how to be mature about this. How to be mature about, about what part? About just not talking? Venus is snoring. I don't know if you guys hear that. She's the golden child. I'm the scapegoat. How, how to be mature about handling the not talking and sharing the space in the house? Okay, so talking about being mature, if, I'm not sure if uh, you're hearing that, but it, talking about being mature about managing like the no contact situation when you're sharing space, it's really awkward to not be on speaking terms with people that you're living with. I've also been in those situations and you just, you just got to go about your business. Like, you know, when you're in the common areas like the kitchen and stuff, just focus on what you're doing, you know, take care of what you're doing and then go back to your room and get out of the house and do what you got to do outside. And if you pass each other, I guess you just don't acknowledge each other. You know, uh, that's, that's where it ended up getting in the situations where I was at before. Um, you know, if, if, I mean, in this case, it's just like, it's a family situation. You have no other need to talk, you know, unless there's something that comes up with bills or something, you have to talk about something like that. And maybe you guys just have like a really brief conversation about that. Um, you know, and, and, but then that's it. And you just keep it about that or something about, you know, something comes up in the house, you know, you have to resolve something you just talk about it, but you just talk about that and that's it. You don't really get into like any conversation. And I know it feels probably really awkward, but if you're in, if, if I remember who you are, um, I think you're in like the no contact situation. 
So, you know, that's just, that's how it works. It's, it's, it's awkward passing people and not even like acknowledging that they're there, but that's, that's really where the situation gets sometimes, you know, when you're still living in, in the situation with narcissists and you can't get out yet and you're not on speaking terms. And sometimes you just have to do that to take care of yourself the best. I mean, this isn't what I wanted, but she almost gave me no choice. Right. You know, she still never answered an email that I sent her almost two months ago. Okay. I do remember who you are then. Yeah. So, you know, you tried to open the dialogue, you tried to have a conversation, you tried to work things out, but she refused. So you had to set a boundary to take care of yourself. And that's the boundary. And she's making it tense. Like the situation is tense now because she is not being an adult about this. She's not talking about things. She's not addressing the email. She's not addressing the issues. And that'll happen with toxic people. And so, you know, it, it just it's at this point now where you're not having the contact because she's unable to have this kind of respectful communication with you. So you have to have that boundary to protect yourself. And then you have to be willing to deal with the discomfort in the short term, you know, but it's not a long-term situation. It's not a healthy long-term situation to stay there to stay around that, you know? So hopefully you can make a plan that within like the next year or so you can get out of there. You can move forward in your life where you won't have to be in that situation because, you know, like I always tell people it's manageable in the short term. You can definitely manage it, but it's just so awkward and so uncomfortable and so draining because you're always holding these boundaries and you're spending so much energy. You have to, it's a matter of survival to hold these boundaries and then you realize once you get to safety and you get to some new place, you don't have to be like this all the time at home and in your sanctuary. Like, wow, how much more energy do you have? How much more clarity do you have to accomplish things in your life? So, you know, like I said, it's short term. Yeah, I'm working on that. Good, good. You know, have patience with yourself. It's, it's not an overnight situation, you know, and like one of the worst things would be just to jump to some situation and get into a worse situation, right? Like, with a significant other or a friend, something who's like a worse narcissist than what's going on at home could be a worse situation or getting into survival fears, you know, that kind of stuff could be really terrifying. It's not really conducive to healing the PTSD when you're in like deep survival money fears, you know? Um, so you want to take care, take care of those needs first, make your plan, you know, and gradually as you're building your self-esteem, you're building your self-love, you're working on these boundaries, you're eventually going to get to that point where you're able to move out and to move forward and things are going to get a lot better. But in the meanwhile, you know, unfortunately, and I'm sorry, it is going to be uncomfortable dealing with that. It's, it's just very uncomfortable to live with someone that you can't be on speaking terms with. And sometimes it does get to that point where you just have to choose you first. That's your self-care. That's you taking care of yourself. That's you saying, mm -mm, this is not respectful. This is not conducive to my health, my sanity, my well-being. I'm no longer going to participate in this relationship upon these terms. You know, we either create new terms for the relationship or we don't have a relationship. And it just gets to that sometimes. So, you know, good job. Good job holding those boundaries and being willing to go through that discomfort in the short term to invest in your long-term peace of mind. Is there a certain age when someone's narcissism solidifies? I think it's in the 30s. I think that's when, that's when it becomes quite set. Um, from what I've noticed, I think there's possibly still, you know, a lot more molding that can happen even into the 20s. You know, um, I think by, by the 30s, that's when the tendencies, I think, really come out strong. You know, and when a person is just like very driven in that direction and once they're so driven in that direction, they just, they just don't see it in any other way. They just don't, they don't work on themselves. They don't want to see themselves. They just can't accept responsibility. They don't want to because, you know, maybe they just, they get used to getting things their way. And so when they know that getting healthy and being a better person is going to involve not demanding to have things their way and get what they want. They definitely don't want that option. That's not the desirable option for them. They want what they want. And they want it now. You know, that's, that's the child in them. You know, the narcissist also is, is an adult child and they're very needy. It's like an infant with an insatiable need. 
um, that wasn't taken care of in infancy and now they're looking to you to take care of it. And it could be that, you know, the life events bring that out more and more by the time a person is in their thirties, for whatever reason, you know, now it's like coming full head. Um, that, that's just, I mean, that's not based on science. That's just my own speculation based on what I've seen in my personal life and in my professional life. Um, that's, that's, that's just my, my take on that. Then why didn't I become a narcissist or am I? Well, I think you became the codependent. I think you became the flip side because it's one or the other. You know, the child will develop either the codependency patterns or the narcissistic patterns. So if you develop the codependency patterns, and that's what you took with you. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes that codependency doesn't become like a full on illness until we're in our 30s. Like we don't realize how much it's like, hampering our life and contaminating our life because we haven't healed that sometimes it's like until we're later in life we're like oh oh wow right um so it could be that in the 30s like that suddenly comes to head too you know but you're younger if i remember i think you're younger um so that's awesome that you're recognizing your codependency um traits a lot earlier because you you're 37 you're like my age so it's awesome you know now at 37 we're finally taking responsibility for ourselves. You know, I'm 38 and we're taking responsibility for ourselves. We're, we're parent reparenting that inner child. We're growing up. We are, you know, realizing that we have these codependency patterns and that we need to break these patterns because we don't want to continue like that. We don't want to continue having that life. We don't want to continue attracting those narcissistic manipulative people anymore. You know, we want to be happy. We don't want to feel this sense of emptiness and loneliness inside. So we need to deal with those inner core wounds and so that we can heal those, those deep inner wounds and then move forward, meeting entirely different people, meeting, having entirely different patterns in our relationships. Because when we no longer have that codependency hook, we no longer hook the narcissist in. Like there's no more attraction, that magnet syndrome, you know, as Ross Rosenberg talks about. Someone says, if you have a conscience, empathy, integrity, et cetera, you are not a narcopath. Exactly. Oh, Venus, please, baby. It's so loud. I know. You know, it's so delicious. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, you're not a narcissist. You know, most of us felt that way. Like, am I the narcissist? You know, and if you're asking that question and wow, Venus, then you're probably not the narcissist because narcissists don't have any sense of self-responsibility and it's very, very, very rare you know, that they do develop that. Um, but I, from what I know about you and your patterns, it sounds to me like you developed the codependency um, patterns, which most of us, you know, who are here did. Someone says, Ross Rosenberg, I think made a video about this. Can I be a codependent and an arc or something like that? I think you're right. I remember seeing that title. I don't know if I've seen that video, but I definitely remember seeing that. He basically said, narcissists don't ask that question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, any therapist will tell you that, you know, well, if you're asking if you're the narcissist, chances are you're not the narcissist. And I can't tell you how many of my clients, like my coaching clients tell me in that first session, do you think, do you think I might be the narcissist? It's like, no, <laughs> no. You know, they convince you that you're selfish when you set boundaries. They convince you, you know, that, that you are some, that somehow something is wrong with you and you're selfish in some way because you're not giving them what they want, you know? And so that's me like, oh, that, and that's a red flag with you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They'll say whatever. They'll say whatever to make you feel that way because if you, if they can manipulate your guilt and thinking that, you know, that you're being selfish by setting that boundary and not giving them what they want, then they're going to get what they want. And so set that boundary and just know it's not being selfish. That's being self-loving. That's taking care of you by setting that boundary. Someone says, if I'm understanding correctly, the reason why scapegoats are scapegoats is because they are most sensitive. And so naturally people pick on the one that is easily hurt. Right. Right. That makes sense. You know, that, that sensitivity makes for like the low hanging fruit sort of, you know, analogy, like the easier victim, because someone who is like very self-assured and isn't bothered, you know, by that kind of, you know, the kind of provocation that a narcissistic person will use, that's not a good target for them. It's boring for them because they're not going to react. 
like they're looking for a person to react. You know, so sensitivity is not a bad quality. It's a great quality to have. It's just that the sensitivity has to be protected with boundaries. And the more sensitive you are, the more psychic you are, the more spiritual you are, the better boundaries you need to have because you have all these layers, you know, of you. And when you connect with someone, you are aware that you are connecting on multiple dimensions and layers and not just the physical and not just the mental and not just the emotional. So you need to make sure that you have spiritual boundaries too, you know, and always be aware of that because you know, the spiritual abuse is just unbelievable. Like, especially people who have the know-how, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so the sensitivity isn't the problem. The boundaries are the problem. And when you grow up in a family with narcissistic abuse or, you know, alcoholism and things like that, the kids will learn that they don't have a right to have boundaries. The scapegoat learns they don't have the right to have boundaries, just like the golden child. You know, the golden child conforms, the scapegoat generally rebels, right? Um, they're two different roles, but they're both receiving the abuse from that parent who's trying to create them into what they want. And, and, and both are easily hurt, you know, um, but the more sensitive a person is, you know, the deeper that hurt can cut, you know, so boundaries, got to have boundaries. She says, as she removes the psychopath again. Someone says, I still have days that I fight with the cognitive dissonance. My ex was emotionless, not grandiose or loud, sometimes not even selfish. I had to become a mind reader, walk on eggshells, and look for those crumbs of affection with a magnifying glass to avoid the controlling sentiments. Can you expound on or have experience with a covert narcissist? I find if I name something, I can understand more. Yes. Whoops. Sorry, that was distracting again. Covert narcissist. Um, yeah, so those are the more complicated ones. They're not like the overt kinds. It's like really obvious. And, you know, like you talked about walking on eggshells, looking for those crumbs of affection, being a mind reader, because the covert narcissist is always the victim. They're always blaming you. You know, it's always your fault, you know, or poor me that... I'm such a martyr sacrificing everything for everybody else and you won't give me this and do what I want and that sort of thing. Um, they, they are very, very confusing. Ross Rosenberg has an excellent video on covert narcissists. I recommend checking that out. You know, the more covert they are, the more confusing it is because the less proof you get ever, you know, the cheating, the lying, the gaslighting, the deceiving, and being that they present themselves as the victim, the covert narcissist looks a lot more like the borderline personality disorder, except the covert narcissist doesn't have the emotional range that the borderline personality disorder has. Equally destructive, but a whole different kind of thing. It's just that they're both coming from that victim status, which is why it's confusing, you know, because they don't seem like an abusive person. It's just that they're using these very covert, aggressive manipulation tactics. Um, I don't know if you have read, I don't recognize your name. I don't know if you have read um, Dr. George Simon's book, In Sheep's Clothing. He outlines technique by technique, each of these covert, aggressive manipulation tactics that manipulative people use. It's really helpful to look at the techniques so that you isolate the techniques from the person. You know, this covert narcissist that you know, and you know, when you see these tactics and you see it happening in real time, then you're like, oh, that's guilt tripping. Oh, that's blame shifting. Oh, that's minimization. And there's like names for all of these techniques that they use, these covert aggressive manipulation techniques. And sometimes you don't even realize that they were manipulating you, like emotionally blackmailing you or something like that. You don't even recognize sometimes that's what's happening because in the moment, your guilt in your conscience is triggered and you feel like you have to do this for them. You feel like it's your responsibility. You feel like it's, it's on you to do it because they make you feel that way. And, you know, until you recognize those covert aggressive manipulation tactics for what they are, it's a lot harder to recognize who you're dealing with and what they're doing and how they're manipulating you. Um, 
So, you know, I would, I would definitely read those. Like you talked about naming something to understand it more. That's, that's exactly what his book does when he names those covert aggressive manipulation tactics. It just like, it, it becomes more sterilized and more clinical and less emotionally reactive when you can see it, what it is, you know, it's like, like I described it, like watching TV, you know, when the emergency broadcast thing comes across the bottom, it's like beep, 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 minimization alert, beep, 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 gaslighting alert, beep, 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 guilt tripping alert, you know, and you start to see it like that, and then you're less emotionally triggered into it. So for example, with the guilt tripping, which is one of, you know, the covert, you know, favorite forms of manipulation, instead of immediately being triggered into the guilt and feeling like you have to rescue the person or take responsibility for whatever is going on with them or happening or their feelings and emotions, instead you'll see it as guilt tripping and it'll be like, yeah, that's not mine. I'm not going to take that, I'm not taking responsibility for that. And so it just becomes a lot easier to deal with that. Um, someone says, whoops, it just jumped around here. In my experience, the roles are very random and the golden child one day and the next day is a scapegoat. So that's kind of more what happened in my family too, where like my brother was definitely more of the scapegoat and I was more of the golden child, but there was a lot of back and forth because sometimes the narcissistic parent does that whole divide and conquer thing. And the more they can keep you guessing and keep you jumping around and keep you fighting amongst yourselves or seeing each other as competition, you know, or like, you know, when you're the, the golden child and the abuse is predominantly going to the scapegoat and that creates a rift between the kids, you know, and, and the parent gets to triangulate the kids that way. It can often happen um, in a lot of families that can happen. Someone says, um, and often the scapegoat can read them in the family circle and call them out on their BS, which they don't like. So, of course, they smear us. Yeah, so the scapegoat is usually the first one to realize the toxic family dynamics, the dysfunction in the family. Usually the scapegoat is the first one to wake up because usually it's more obvious to them. They can usually see it a lot more. Whereas the golden child in conforming and sacrificing their authenticity to be, you know, whatever the parent wanted the golden child to be, um, you know, they've, they've given up themselves to a certain degree as well, but it's a lot harder for them because they're in a deeper state of denial. You know, they, they have more of this, like they have created a false persona too. Everybody has in that family, but they've created this persona of being the golden child, you know, being the stellar student or the star or, the caretaker or the overachiever or whatever that role was. And usually they're more in denial because they had to put on the face. They had to conform to that face and be like happy, even though they're not happy deep down, even when they're suffering, they learned they had to do this or they were going to get beat or, you know, criticized or just cruelty, some form of punishment, you know, from the parent, if they didn't put on that false persona out in public. Um, someone also wrote, who's pulling your strings by Harriet Breaker spells out the whole gamut of manipulation tactics and how to combat them. I had not heard of that. Thank you so much. Who's Pulling Your Strings by Harriet Breaker. Someone says, yeah, I did call them out. LOL, it's my Irish blood. Someone says, wow, you guys are brave. I could never call them out. It's, it's really hard. It's often not recommended, you know, because that's when you trigger the narcissistic injury if you're dealing with a narcissist, you know. Um, and sometimes, though, you feel like you have to speak your truth at least once because you just have to speak it. Like if you're, if you're a person coming from the codependency patterns of, I don't feel heard and I can't use my voice, right? Because that tends to go together. I feel like no one hears me. And I feel like I can't speak my voice. I feel like I can't speak my truth. I feel like, you know, I, my voice, right? It's something to do with the voice. If you have those kind of issues, you know, then, then you know you're in those patterns where you have to speak your truth in some way. Like you, you have to get it out in some way because it's all stuck in there. You know, it's all like welled up in there. Maybe you need to get to go cry out too because like often we choke our tears right here. You know, instead of feeling the sadness and allowing ourselves to cry and express the sadness, we'll choke it down right here. This is self-expression, the fifth chakra. So if you have issues of self-expression, which again, tends to be also on the flip side, I feel like people don't hear me, 
that wound that tends to go together, you know, so you really want to work on speaking your truth. And, you know, I would start with someone safe, like a therapist, you know, a, a good therapist that you trust, you know, you're building a relationship with, you're working on either PTSD or the abuse recovery or the inner child work, something along those lines, you know, and your therapist at least kind of has an idea of what's going on for you and can help you through that process, you know, of speaking your truth you know, talking, speaking the unspeakable, talking about the abuse, talking about your feelings about the abuse. And it's definitely safer to do that, you know, with a good therapist or someone else. You could be your acupuncturist, it could be your massage therapist, it could be your holistic doctor, whatever that you go to, and you have the opportunity to speak your truth there. It's not like a talk therapy session, but like, in, in whatever is going on in your treatment, you speak something and in speaking that thing, it's like you release that energy that you were stuck in holding on to and that's so liberating you know and maybe you feel like you never need to like go and confront your family because there's just nothing nothing good will come of that you know like my therapist told me when i was going to go do it you know with my mom she was like don't have any expectations like don't go in there with any expectations be very protected you know definitely have your guard up your boundaries up if you're going to go in and do that um, but not to have any expectations and not to be attached to the outcome. Like if you're whomever, if your parent or your partner, whomever just doesn't even hear you and puts you down and, you know, tries to abuse you in the moment for calling them out, don't be attached to that. That's all about them. That's not about you. It doesn't have anything to do with your healing. You can walk away from that. Um, but it's, it's generally not recommended to confront the narcissist, you know, usually a lot better to work that out in therapy or support groups or with really trusted friends or some other, you know, practitioner where you can feel safe to speak your truth and express those feelings. Is this why my mom is nice to me right now because my sister and I aren't talking and my mom is getting something from this? Yes. And that's probably part of it. The other thing is that, you know, when the narcissist is being nice to you, it's, it's for the goal of getting something. You know, the narcissistic parent will often be nice and sweet when they want you to settle back into them, you know, because if you lean back into her and you start trusting her, confiding in her and sharing personal things with her again, you drop your boundaries, she's going to take advantage of that. She's going to hurt you again, you know, so that's always something to look at when the narcissist is being kind, you know, the doses of kindness, that is a big part of the Stockholm syndrome. Remember that um, the dose of kindness that the abuser gives to the target. So you want to be careful of that because that will open your heart and it will make you vulnerable and you don't want to open your heart to someone who's not safe. You want to save that, you know, for people that are safe to do that with. Someone says, what if the narc is a psychotherapist, psychiatrist, clinician, etc., and they think they know you better, they, wow they think they know better than you about NPD and you call them out. Ouch. Okay. That's a bummer. Um, but also recognize that there are a lot of psychotherapists, psychiatrists, clinicians, whatever that are narcissists. Like the field is full of them, you know, not all of them, but there's a lot of them in the field. Um, if that, if you're talking about like a parent or a partner in your life who happens to also be a psychiatrist, psychotherapist, whatever. Yeah. You just got to understand that, you know, that person is, is manipulating you. They're using their position, you know, to take advantage of you, to try to confuse you, to try to tell you that they know better than you and they can't possibly be wrong. And you got to listen to your intuition, you know, that the piece of paper degrees that they have doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean anything, you know, in this situation. Like you got to listen to your intuition, know who you are, know what you're dealing with, know that you're seeing these signs it's really freaking clear to you you know and you don't need their approval like just because they have the title doesn't mean that you need their approval you know because they could be using that to abuse you and to manipulate you to confuse you to make you self-doubt to make you feel inferior which is the narcissist game you know and it's just it's really confusing in that situation it's, it's like very similar to being in a relationship with either romantically or just as in a religious relationship with like a minister, preacher, spiritual guru leader sort of thing. It's very similar. When you're talking about the psychotherapist, psychiatrist situation, I've talked to a lot of clients who've actually been in those situations, you know, and it's very damaging because this person is like an authority figure. And they're also a person that you've gone to for some form of healing 
or that you at least you maybe you have more of an intimate relationship with them, but you associate them with that title and you know that knowledge and you know that that work and some part of you is looking you know toward them as some kind of authority in that realm and so it's like the parent you know the authority figure and again as an adult you got to turn that approval around give that approval to yourself give that validation to yourself and recognize that you got to trust your intuition no matter what they say don't let them confuse you, you know, especially if that's a cerebral type, the cerebral narcissist, you know, oh man, they will run your head. Don't even, don't even listen to that. Don't even participate in those conversations. Don't let those words get in because man, those words will just, wow. Like no other narcissist, the cerebral narcissist and the head games that they play, um, which tends to be the psychotherapist, psychiatrist tends to be the cerebral type. So um, that's something to be aware of and, and just know that any communication coming from them is meant to like spin your mind. So don't really, don't really, you know, invest in that. Don't invest emotionally. Don't get connected to that. Uh, I don't know what your situation, I'm sorry, if you're living with this person or what the relationship is, um, but be very, very careful that you don't like surrender your sense of approval to that person. Yes, absolutely. They drive you insane. They make the most absurd arguments just to prove they're right. Exactly. It's just so twisted, you know, the games that they play. Um, it's like, it's mind fucking to a whole different level. All right, so our stalker situation is escalating. Sending in from multiple sources and for whatever reason, I'm unable to remove this person. Why is that happening? Right. This is unbelievable. I'm just gonna keep taking screenshots of this. I mean, I am going to the police now. Uh, you know, I'm filing this report. This is just unbelievable. Oh, now he's gone. Okay. Um, someone says, my best friend used to tell me that she could hear from my voice when I would be in a bad space, even when I was pretending to be okay. Right. So that sounds like a good friend, you know, who, who recognizes that you weren't being authentic, that you were hiding your feelings um, about what was going on, pretending that things were okay. You know, we, we all learned to do that. You know, we put on this face like everything's okay. You know, and we stuffed the feelings down and that's where things fester and get worse. That's where that PTSD festers and gets worse. You know, but that's an awesome friend who calls you out and says, hey, friend, you know, something's going on. I feel you. And if you want to talk about it, it's okay. You don't have to. But so, you know, I feel it. And if you want to talk about it, it's okay to talk about it. Those are the good friends, you know, the ones who are, who are there when things are heavy, too. You know, they don't just run away when things get heavy and hard for you. They're there for you, you know, they're, they're empathic and intuitive in that way where like you don't even say it and they know it, you know, they, they know something's not right or like you, maybe you meet a partner even, you know, and you have this dynamic in the partnership where they feel you and they're like, you're right, some, I feel something. And you're like, actually, yeah, it's funny that you can feel that, you know, that's somebody who's in tune with you. That's what empathy is. Empathy is feeling someone else. You know, the ability to feel someone else, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, someone says, narcs definitely pop up in therapy, religious and spiritual circles. If you think about, it's a great way to prey on people while they are in a vulnerable space. Yeah, that can definitely happen. You know, they just it's like, 
it's like prime targets is what they're going there to find. That's why I always tell people, you know, definitely have your boundaries, suit up, you know, before you go into those spaces and keep looking for the right group. Don't settle, just like don't settle for a bad relationship, a relationship that's not really working for you. Don't settle for a support group that's not working for you just because you don't have anything else in your life. It's better to be, you know, deal with the discomfort of the aloneness and the loneliness and trust that that's there for a reason. The universe is encouraging you to spend time alone, really get to know yourself, really purge, you know, those old patterns from your life, really, you know, have the opportunity to observe yourself. And like, as you heal yourself, you start to meet more people, maybe you start to meet more groups, you start to connect in the right way as you're ready you know, to attract those people, those groups, those new families that we create, you know, it's definitely important to have that. There just might be a period of time, you know, in the early healing stages where you might feel really alone. Like a lot of us went through really alone periods of time. And that's the time when you want to work on yourself, you know, just keep working on yourself until you keep meeting these people in your life and the right groups, and the right professionals, the right friends, the new family. Someone says, does it mean that my mom doesn't know how to love, or she just doesn't love me at all? Either way, she never really loved me or my sis. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for your mom. I don't know your mom. But the general tendency with these cluster B personality types is that they just can't love. They can't have intimacy and attachment like the rest of us. They don't allow that. They Something happened in childhood where they can no longer connect to those feelings. And, you know, Sam, Dr. Sam Backman described his relationship with his wife, something like that. I think he said, like, somebody asked him, like, do you love your wife? And he said something like, you know, I love her in the way that I would define love, or I love her as best as I could love, or something of that nature. That's not the exact quote, but... He was saying something like that, you know, and in his own way, he probably has some kind of affection for her, you know, but it's a very toxic dynamic and it only works because she plays the enabler and she allows it, you know, um, and, and so in the situation, you know, with the narcissistic parent, it's like, it's devastating to have that realization that your parent never really loved you you know, and it's not your fault. And that's the thing because the little inner child believes I am unlovable. I am unworthy of love. I am not good enough because my own parent didn't love me. So there must be something wrong with me because that's how the child internalizes it. And so now as an adult, you got to look at that and recognize that like, it's not your fault that your mom didn't love you. Like you deserved to be loved like a little child on this earth your mom didn't have that capability. Like she simply couldn't love you like that. That's it. She just simply couldn't love you like that. And it's, it's really hard to move through that acceptance. I recommend the book, um, Mothers Who Can't Love, Healing Guide for Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers. Um, oh wait, not that one. This is a good one. There was another one. Yes. Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers by Carol McBride. That is a fantastic book for uh, children of narcissists. I mean, I guess it would probably apply, you know, if you had a father who was a narcissist, there would be a different dynamic. But the effects on the child would probably be very, very similar. Like, am I good enough? You know, asking these questions. And, and that is the question that gets asked when the infant, you know, comes into the world and doesn't receive that loving and that welcoming and like, we're so happy you're here kind of energy and they get like, you know, left and neglected and, and not held, and not really loved, like they need to be loved. We, we need that, you know, to be healthy. And so that was the attachment trauma that took place in childhood because your mother wasn't able to love you in the way that a mother should love her child. And mourning that loss is very important in the self-healing process, you know, and in, in reparenting your inner child, then you want to be there for your inner child and tell your inner child, I will never abandon you. I will always listen to you. I am so happy you're here. You are so worthy of love, you know, and sending these kinds of messages to your inner child, being the parent, the kind of parent that your inner child really needs, that nurturing, supportive, 
loving, uplifting parent, you know, and, and you can change those dynamics now as an adult. What you won't likely ever find is that from your mother, you know, so mourning that, accepting that, recognizing that you got to be there for yourself and give that to yourself and not look for that from your mother, you know, and just totally accept that that's, that's what things were. She just couldn't love you like you deserve to be loved. Ross Rosenberg said to just observe when they are raging. Yeah, he calls it uh, observe, don't absorb. When I finally woke up to what he was, it was like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a shocker when you first wake up to it, you know, and, and when you are awake, that's when you're able to start observing and not being caught in the reaction. Absorption is what Ross Rosenberg calls it, right? The reaction is when they provoke you and you react like the child. They provoke you, you react. They provoke you, you react, and it just keeps going on and on. Once you realize what that is and you have this new awareness, now you can take a step back. You can depersonalize the abuse. You can be the observer, the witness. You know, like they talk about in Buddhism, where you're not emotionally invested in that charge and in that situation. So now you can respond to the situation from your authentic self versus reacting in that trigger sort of parent-child toxic dynamic way. Um, someone says, I don't wish to knock people who are religious. However, my religious now late ex-narc was intolerably self-righteous. Yeah, they'll be self-righteous in whatever beliefs they have. You know, if it's religiosity or spiritual, you know, if it's like Buddhism or New Ageism or like whatever their thing is, or maybe their thing is just logic and academia, you know, and like none of that spiritual stuff, you know, they're self-righteous about whatever their thing is, you know, very rigid in those beliefs, whatever their beliefs are. Okay, I think this is talking about the mom situation, but she's so caring to everyone else, like my dad and other relatives. I have that book and I'm reading it now. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so that's a front though. Remember that caring thing, that's a front. She's doing that because she's getting something, she wants something from them. That's why. It's unnerving when you see them being so kind and caring to other people and they're treating you like crap. You know, that's the nature of this beast. Someone said to that person, it's an act. They know how to mimic it, especially around other people. Yeah, that's their mask. Someone says to that person, I think so too. It looks like they're caring to everyone else. I met a narc therapist and all the patients loved them. <laughs> wow. Oh, we're talking about therapists here. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that's like the narc in the position of like the spiritual guru or leader or the minister, preacher, narcissist, like the congregation is like in love with them. You know, the community is like worshiping them and just no one can see it. No one knows because all they see is that mask, that facade. Um, probably very similar dynamic with the narcissist therapist. Someone says the people in their personal life, on the other hand, not so much Yeah the people very close to them are the ones who bear the brunt of the abuse. You know, they're the only ones who see the other side of the mask. Um, someone said to that person, it's good that you saw through that therapist. Yeah. Thanks. It took a lot of safe therapy and a lot of YouTube. Yeah. I'm glad you have a much better therapist now. That's really important. Uh, thank you to the person who notified me that he logged in again. Thank you. Um, I think it was a strategy. He left for a while so we could feel safe in order to log in a bit later so you wouldn't notice. Yeah, that's, that's his strategy with communication so far. Set the boundary and then he'll disappear for a little bit. And then like, you know, I, when I sent the cease and desist letter about 10 days ago, you know, two Saturdays ago, um, and very clearly explained, you know, to never come back to these and to any other contact, you know, and then he disappeared for a while. And everybody I talked to said, oh, he's just biding his time. That's what these people do. I said, I know. I know what the psychopath is. I, I lived with people like that. I know what it's like to live with that. It's like sheer terror. You know, so this person just being across the country is um, not a big deal, um, but just definitely going to need to handle that um, with the authorities. 
thank you also for your eyes and for keeping a watch out. Um, someone says, in your experience, do others ever see the narc for who they are and what they're doing? I've gone on in life for myself, but validation sure would be sweet. Do others ever see? Well, you know, sometimes. Sometimes and usually it's only the people that are victims of the narcissist. Um, though sometimes, you know, sometimes people who are just really intuitive and really sure of who they are will just feel it. They'll just be like, I never liked that person from the beginning. He just felt like a fake. Um, that happened actually, uh, ironically, one of the first person that I was working with in Peru last year in the medicine circle, you know, he was like a borderline personality disorder character and one of the um one of the guests that came to the retreat after she left like a week after everything fell apart and i left there running um and i told her you know i, I left there I'm no longer there anymore and she goes i knew something was wrong with him i just knew it and i'm like wow because she was the only one like no one else got it she was only there for 10 days and somehow she saw it she knew it she's very intuitive um, you know, sensitive, empathic person. She picked up on it. She's also very sure of who she is. So it was clear to her, you know, and that, that was just so refreshing because usually when you're in the smear campaign, you're so alone because you're like, nobody gets it. Nobody else sees it. Nobody else gets it. You know, is it, would anybody else ever see it? And often nobody else does. And often you feel really alone every now and then, you know, you'll come across a person who will validate you and be like, yeah, I totally see that. Yeah, he won't give up easily. Someone says, yes, I will be careful. I'm going to the police. Um, since narcissists have probably always been around, why, whoops, why has it taken so long for the word to get out? Would have been nice to have known about it. Yeah, you know, I asked myself that question too. I think that there's definitely an agenda keeping this subverted for the same reason when you look in mainstream media, you know, what you see is a very distorted idea of what is narcissism. Like they don't talk about the abuse at all. They talk about selfies and looking in the mirror and looking good. And like most of the stuff that doesn't even matter, like somebody who's taking a lot of selfies and looking at themselves in the mirror and pumping up at the gym and taking, like, they're not hurting anybody. You know, we're totally missing the point here. And so when the media does this, the disfavor of, you know, distracting us from the real issues, people don't notice, you know, why? Because these people are running the world, you know, psychopaths are running governments and corporations and medical institutions and all sorts of areas of society. And they don't want people to figure the deal out because this is the problem that's wrong with the world. Like everything else falls under that umbrella like everything else. And that, I think that's why it's just been subver subverted for so long. But now there's such an uprising of awareness, like people just awakening and realizing what's going on. And now with the internet, it's so much easier because information is now ubiquitous. And like the last really, I mean, if you look at all the YouTube channels of all the professionals and all of the survivors who are talking about, you know, narcissistic abuse, like look at the dates. It's mostly in the last two to five years. There's very little that was before five years ago, you know, out there. And there's people like Dr. George Simon who's been around for decades. Ross Rosenberg has been around for decades. You know, there's some people like that, you know, but it's really been in the last five or so years that this is really reaching that collective consciousness level. More and more people are becoming aware of the keywords, you know, and, and, and what these dynamics are, um, which is awesome. It's amazing that, that the word is getting out. And the more we talk about it, the more people, you know, are going to realize what's going on. And millions of people are being affected by this and not even realizing. Are narcs like my mom, oh, are narcs like my mom, who is really good at reading people, good judgment of character? Is that a question? Yes. Um, yes. They, so they have this like uncanny sense of knowing what your vulnerabilities are. Like, right. They do have some kind of uh, interview skills where they're interviewing to find out what your vulnerabilities are, but they also seem to have some kind of uncanny intuitive knowing of what some of those are and, and who would be a good, you know, victim to manipulate and how to manipulate those people. Um, you know, so yeah, narcissists are often quite good at reading people. Um, 
you know, when they're, when they're looking to pre-qualify a victim or when they're looking like, how, how can I most trigger this person right now? You know, what can I do that's most going to set them off in this moment? Yeah. They, they can use like just uncanny abilities to do that. Um, someone says, I couldn't agree more with the NPS personalities being hushed up by media because they are the leaders of countries, corporations, and generally wielding big power. Indeed. Indeed. Um, someone says, there are levels of NPD and psychopathy and sociopathy, like Ted Bundy, who scores high because he had that whole charismatic charm, etc. Most of them are very charming. You know, most of psychopaths are quite charming or at least have that side of them. They can put on that mask when they need to, which is why most people are so confused and have no idea that they're actually dealing with a psychopath. Um, you know, and the narcissist as well, known to be charming, sociopath as well, known to be charming. I think the borderline is less charming. They do have some kind of charm. Um, most of the men that I talked to who got hooked into borderline women got hooked into her like uh seemed like a like a loving charm like she was giving them lots of like attention and it seemed like the love bombing for them seemed like that was part of their charming it was she seemed like this nurturing kind of woman um but wasn't actually she was doing those things you know to get them you know in just like when your mom is being nice to you that kind of thing so that they all do have their form of charisma and charm it's not to say that every charming person is on that scale, but they use that charm against other people. Like it's part of their mask and it's what, it's what gets people to drop their defense mechanisms. You know, when they see this like charming person, you know, the defense mechanisms drop, they start trusting that person and that's where, that's where it becomes dangerous. Michael Cross has a good YouTube channel worth checking out. That's funny. I think you sent me a message about that too. I had just found one of his videos last week, I think. I can't remember what it was. I think I bookmarked it to go back later. Thank you for that recommendation, Michael Cross. I think that's the name of his channel too, isn't it? Yes. Someone says, um, yes, it's like everyone thinks narcissists are just people like Ted Bundy and they ignore the rest of the spectrum. Right. So they think that they're just like serial killers or something like that. Like psychopath is just a serial killer. They don't realize that a psychopath is like the person, you know, hiding themselves in society, pretending to be some kind of contributor to society even. Yeah, it's very confusing. You know, that's why I think the media does such a huge disservice when they focus on unimportant things or, you know, like they'll paint the psychopath in, in, in the light of, the serial killer and then not tell you that that's only like a certain small percentage of psychopaths. Most of them never commit murder, but they commit soul murder every day. You know, they're killing the soul of the people in their life. Um, it's just not visible, you know, like, like the physical side. Um, someone says, which is most of it. I think narcopath is a more complete way to define them. Yeah. You know, that's the thing like that, that cluster B, spectrum there's just so many similarities and there's so much comorbidity you know are they this or are they that i don't know they have all these traits you know the point is that they are a toxic manipulative abusive person who's not going to change someone says here i wonder if anyone knows brie bonche she has written a lot of insightful articles about narc abuse i have not heard of this person thank you for bringing that b-o-n-c-h-a-y Brie Bonche. Her website is called Relationshippedia. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, y'all. I am going to, I think I'm caught up here. I'm going to wrap it up for this early session today. Oh, thank you. Um, if anybody would like that link for Brie Bonche, relationship, Relationshippedia, like encyclopedia relationshippedia.me. Um, check out that website. Thank you. All right, guys, I am going to wrap it up for this session. Um, I will be back here in four hours at six o'clock Pacific. Thank you to all of you for showing up and bringing your questions and your comments. And again, my apologies for that disturbance today. I am going to resolve that and hopefully very soon that will no longer be a problem. 
All right. Sending you all a big hug. Talk to you soon.